Welcome to Women's Voices. My name is Genevieve Gluck, and I'm speaking with Dr. Kathleen Stock. Dr. Stock is a professor of philosophy at the University of Sussex, who has written a number of articles for peer-reviewed academic publications, primarily on aesthetics, sexual objectification, and the impact of modern gender theory on the rights of women and girls. She was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire for her contributions to higher education, after which many philosophers took to social media to object, circulating an open letter concerning transphobia in philosophy. Despite the criticism leveled against her, she has recently published a philosophical examination of the main tenets of gender ideology called Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism, available now in both hardback and in electronic format. Congratulations on the publication of your book. And Thank you. I'm curious, what can readers expect from uh, this book and what prompted you to write it? Well, I think they can expect um, an accessible examination of some of the intellectual background, such as it is, to um, the current craze for gender identity ideology, which seems to be turning the heads of politicians and policymakers all over the place, particularly, I mean, in the UK, we're really experiencing that, but also in other English speaking countries and some uh, European countries too, and beyond. So I'm looking at how those ideas kind of got started and mixed with other ideas. So it's a kind of intellectual exploration. It's also looking at some of the consequences of those ideas when they're put into practice for women and girls in particular, and for children. And, and then I'm also interested in how it affects gay people as well, because I think there are effects all over the place once you start thinking that gender identity is more important than sex. And what prompted me to write it? Well, I had been writing some blog posts really in a kind of desperate state, really thinking that this was an area that academics including philosophers really should be getting into because it's about identity, it's about metaphysics, but it's also about ethics and politics, you know, so that's a, a prime looking topic for philosophers in particular, but I didn't find the kind of lively discussion out there. There was basically fear and particularly fear of being critical of any aspect of gender identity ideology. So I wrote these blog posts initially to try and stimulate others I thought to get involved and I did to some extent but I eventually decided that I had to write the book that would or a book that would settle this out as clearly as I could because no one else was going to apparently um, not not within philosophy anyway so that's that's kind of what prompted me. There's this kind of idea that gender ideology originated within academia, which is something that you've commented on before and many others have talked about the impact of postmodernism. I'm curious how it is that it came to be so prevalent in the mainstream dialogue and how it's come to shape these laws. Well, I mean, I'm not a historian, so I, I, I stress that I don't give an overview of historically how this has happened. I pick out some big moments, I think, in the history of this ideology. For instance, Simone de Beauvoir famously saying, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So that's, that's a sort of big moment in the sense that, not that I think she had any conception of how that phrase would be used, but it's set in a chain of thought and process, which, and now that, you know, that sentence is used all the time to justify the idea that trans women are literally women, or that even that gender identity makes you a woman. And then there are other strands as well, like the influence of Anne Fausto Sterling, who's a historian of science, talking about people with differences of sexual development, and then the influence of Judith Butler. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of strands converging intellectually, but how it all got hold of people so firmly I think is a question I don't fully understand myself except that it's a very the, the sort of modern gen version of gender identity theory is very simple and simplistic maybe it's sort of easy to hang on to it's very very simple childishly simple and it's also I think a symptom of, of society's continuing deep discomfort with sex nonconformity 
actually, perversely, although people on my side of the fence are always being accused of being transphobic and bigoted, I think, in a sense, our opponent's obsession with what I would see as infantilizing trans people in terms of this very simplistic narrative really betrays their own defensive discomfort about people who are non-conforming in terms of their sex. So I think there's something psychoanalytic going on as well that I, you know, I, I don't really talk about too much about that, but I think other people should. And I'm hoping that this will become much more talked about in years to come. So what are the core tenets of your book, the arguments in particular that you chose to focus on? Well, I, I've tried to break it down into a, um, a kind of plot, as it were, a sort of a very um, straightforward narrative. So the first chapter is really about these big moments in the history of gender identity, as I understand them historically, and I present that relatively neutrally. Then I tackle what is biological sex, because there's just so much misrepresentation and bad theorizing around biology now. So I try and, you know, give a positive conception of biological sex, or actually I give three, I say, well, you know, here's three, pick one, but none of them have the consequences that uh, trans activism would say they have. And then in that chapter, I talk about people like Butler and Donna Haraway and Anne Fausto Sterling, Thomas Lecoeur, and I talk critically about them. And then, then I have a chapter about why sex matters, which is you know, it's very strange that I should have to point it out or that anyone should have to point it out. But obviously some people don't seem to understand how sex makes a difference to social life. So I go through four areas where I think it unambiguously makes a difference. Medicine, sport, sexual orientation and sexual assault statistics. And then I go into what is gender identity. So I look at various theories, both sort of medicalized theories and postmodern theories of gender identity and and give a positive account of my own. Then there's a chapter, what is a woman? Because within philosophy, it's quite common for people to say, oh, well, of course, sex exists, but still trans women are women. You know, of course, there's such thing as female and male, but femaleness does not map on to womanhood exactly. So I really, in that chapter, tackle all those arguments. And then I have a chapter on fiction. So I think effectively people who say that people can change sex or that trans women are women or that trans men are men are immersed in a fiction and I talk I am a philosopher of fiction that's my background originally so I talk I bring that expertise to bear there and I try and talk about how being immersion in a fiction personally can have beneficial aspects but it can also have negative aspects and what we really want to avoid is institutions and laws compelling us to immerse ourselves in a fiction, which is now increasingly what we have around gender identity. And then the rest is about how we got here. Historically speaking, I mean, again, I don't give an overview, but I have a few. I try and plant a few seeds. And the final chapter is about where we go next and how we can try and forge some kind of common ground with trans activists in the sense that I think many of the well, some of the basic concerns are, are, are shared between feminists and trans activists. It's just that there's vast divergence on the solutions or even diagnosis of the problem. So, um, yeah, that's the overview. <laughs> it's probably more, more information than you wanted, but <laughs> that's it. Just out of curiosity, what would one example of those shared concerns that you mentioned be? Like, do you mean something like male violence? Uh, no, I don't talk about that but I do think that particularly the younger kind of generation who are interested in being non-binary or at least who feel themselves to be non-binary those people that do and it is I think largely a kind of a younger movement that they are concerned really in some way to get rid of sort of stultifying uh, norms around sex or what what they would call you know gender I try not to use the word gender too much because it's just so confusing. So I lay out different things you might mean by gender in the beginning. And then I say, I'm basically not going to use the word gender. So I would say being non-conforming around sex. But I think non-binary people really do, in some sense, want to smash oppressive gender norms, inverted commas. And so do many feminists. It's just that they have very different ideas about how to do that. So I think we could 
we could have that discussion productively. Obviously, we're not really having it at the moment because we're, we're at completely different poles in the culture war, as it were, but I think common ground could be forged. So you've written in the past about aesthetics, imagination, and fiction, and also female objectification. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you see any connection between the objectification of women in media and gender ideology? Yes, I do. And in fact, there is a um, section in my book about that. I think the objectification of women on, and I mean females, on a massive scale is at the heart of many <laughs> societal problems for women and girls. And this is one of them. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's the only cause of gender identity ideology by any means, but it's certainly, it's there. I mean, the idea that womanhood is a costume or womanhood is an appearance is absolutely bound up with an objectifying way of looking at women as sort of aesthetic surfaces, basically, as kind of shapes. <laughs> if you've got the right shape, then you're a woman or, or sexually attractive objects. So, you know, I have, I say in the book that I had once had a trans woman say to me, you know, I must be a woman because heterosexual males want to have sex with me. You know, and that, <laughs> that's seems incredible but I actually think in a kind of increasingly pornified objectifying society that kind of logic is in the ascendant so absolutely tie those two things together of course womanhood is not a costume and being a woman is far more than what you look like or how sexually attractive you are but um, that's not a message that seems to be getting through. On the same note I wonder if you had seen some of those quotes from Andrea Long Chu and the book. Yeah, I, you, I actually talk about those two. Um, so I talk about autogynophilia in this connection as well. Autogynophilia is, is clearly a component of the trans community or whatever you call it. I wouldn't call it a community, actually, but there are some trans people who are autogynophilic. I find that beyond question. Andrea Long Chu talks about in her so I use preferred pronouns for the purposes of this book, but I also have a big section examining the costs of that. So that's just for people who are listening and thinking why is she using preferred pronouns, but that's what I'm doing. So Andrew Long Chu has a, this book called Females and talks about forced feminization, the fetish of forced feminization, sissification, where the fantasy is that you're, you know, as a man, you're forced into being feminized and made sissy. And there's all these jaw dropping sentences in the book about how this is the essence of femalehood being, you know, being sissified or being reduced to, I think, what does it say? An expectant asshole and blank, blank eyes or something. So, yeah, I talk about that. <laughs> I think it's actually really um, instructive about some aspects of the trans experience. Not all, though. I do also say that there can be a tendency amongst radical feminists, I think, to overplay autogynophilia and also to pathologize it. But I think mentioning this stuff obviously has a bearing and people need to know about it when the discussion is about changing rooms and shared spaces. Well, you know, formerly single sex spaces where people, where women get undressed and that's a an important aspect of the conversation. And, and as you know, I'm sure every, everyone listening knows probably, there's been huge resistance to talking about autogynophilia. People like Michael J. Bailey and Alice Drager, when they've written about it, have faced horrific harassment because there's just such shame around it and such a desire to suppress any discussion of that. But I think we need a conversation about it, like an adult conversation about it, and we need to connect it to objectification. I assume there must be a connection between the development of that psychological profile and the increasing objectification of women. So that's why I try and do a bit. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think there's probably a larger discussion that could be had about pornography in academia at the moment, including mm -hmm. people like Andrea Long Chu and how that could be shaping some of these attitudes. So I've seen this idea floating around in the gender ideology debate, especially in academia, that being a woman is associated with these kinds of stereotypes such as submissiveness. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. 
Well, I think um, that turns out to be the consequence of a lot of things that academics do say, although I don't see that many academics, apart from people like Andrew Longchu, explicitly saying that womanhood is the occupation of a submissive social role. But there is this quite popular view or historically popular view amongst feminist philosophers, for instance, that womanhood is something social. And although that's actually been displaced in the sort of zeitgeist more recently with the idea that womanhood isn't even something social, it's just something psychological. But if we, if we just stick to the idea it's something social, then in practice, what seems to happen with that idea is that it becomes the idea that womanhood is the socially submissive role. Now, there was, in radical feminism, um, people like Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin also thought that womanhood was equivalent to occupying a sexually submissive role. And they thought that manhood was equivalent to occupying a sexually dominant role. But they didn't think you should keep the roles. <laughs> you know, they wanted to smash the roles. They wanted to get rid of objectification. So in a sense, they wanted to get rid of women and men as they understood them. So I also talk about that in the book, you know, the traditional feminist idea of associating womanhood with a, a set of social behaviours or expectations was not to con the conservative idea that then you would keep these in place. But in because feminism has now tried to be in different all sorts of different ways trans inclusive in, and what they mean by that is to be able to say with conviction that trans women are really women they have lost the capacity effectively to criticize the social role of womanhood because now they're effectively saying that if you want to occupy it, you should be able to, and that makes you a woman. So it's really defanged or made toothless feminism, basically. Modern feminism can no longer really criticize any of the, uh, the social expectations around femaleness because it's adopted this conservative defensive crouch basically, in response to trans activist demands. Why is it, do you think, that it's only the question of what is a woman that's really being mm -hmm. asked in all of this? What could it possibly be? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I mean, I think in a lot of discussions of misogyny, and I'm not saying it's not misogyny, but I think what gets missed out is that people, including women, are constantly triaging even unconsciously and thinking, where can I have the most impact? Who, who's in, whose behavior can I influence most? You know, who will basically capitulate first? And I think people make that calculation and come up with the answer that women will capitulate first. And to some extent they're right, you know? I mean, I think they, unfortunately the, the history of this shows that women have capitulated. Feminists have capitulated, that sector organizations have capitulated. So it wasn't a stupid strategy. But I think, you know, people generally, both women and men, understand that women's boundaries tend to be more permeable. They tend to be more socially aware. They tend to, or at least it, social ostracism is feared more. I don't know. I mean, I'm making vast generalizations, but something's got to explain this. I think people just think, right, OK, well, I'm not going to push this line with men because they wouldn't it wouldn't get anywhere. And of course, the other thing is, I mean, another salient fact is that a lot of trans activism historically has come from males. And so that's the other side of the coin, that there's more aggression, there's more insistence, there's more entitlement. <laughs> now, I'm not saying, I, I, I say nothing in the book about where I think these social, these where these characteristics come from. I'm making generalizations there about the sexes, and I'm not saying those things are nature or nurture, I don't go into that at all, but I'm just saying, you know, sociologically, it seems like trans women have been more demanding than trans men. And sociologically, women as a group have been more accommodating than men to trans activism. So I think both of those things are relevant here. Yeah, it kind of strikes me that in the case of men presenting as women do so to enter private spaces, right? But then women present as masculine in order to enter public spaces, in a sense. Yeah, is... that's interesting. I think I wouldn't, like every generalization I've made, there's lots of exceptions. You know, I try and steer clear in the book of like 
any kind of stigmatization and any kind of sort of oversimplified story about why people transition or why males transition. So I don't endorse the kind of the theory that they're all are, you know, they're all out to get into private spaces. But the private, you know, the, the bathroom thing has loomed very large, hasn't it? And it's often said to be motivated by fears about violence from other males towards trans women. But the trans activist movement could have chosen to lobby for third spaces, but they didn't. So I think that is also an interesting fact about this. You know, why didn't trans activists take the much more sensible route of saying trans women can't go into male bathrooms? It's you know, it's too dangerous for them. So they need separate bathrooms or, but they didn't, they just said they had to be in the women's spaces. And women often rightly make the argument that if that were the case, um, we would lose boundaries, privacy, safety, which is fair. And I wonder like, how, how would it ever even be possible for women to tell any difference between someone who has a good intention or someone who doesn't? And in general, preserving the value of women-only spaces for its own right. What would you say to that? Well, I agree. I mean, the thing that got me into this debate was the rise of gender identity as an ideology, because that says that you are a woman, irrespective of your presentation. You can look any way as a male, including masculine presenting, and still be a woman, or have a legitimate right of entry into changing rooms and showers and bathrooms and hostels and prisons if you have the right feelings inside. Now, of course, I mean, it, it's just childishly obvious that that is no way to run uh, safeguarding policies, which were originally set up to protect women who are physically, on average, physically smaller and weaker and are the subject of sexual interest from males. It's no way to run policies protecting them. It's absolutely crazy. but. The problem with that policy is that it just it undermines the social norm, which says you can roughly tell where someone should be by looking at them. Of course, that's not infallible. No one ever said it was. Of course, missexing goes on and that can be distressing for whoever's the subject of it. But generally, the idea was that if a woman saw someone who was like male looking in their changing room, they could say, sorry, you shouldn't be here. And that's a kind of protection for them in a world in which sexual predation is so common. So to move to the idea of inner feelings as the arbiter of who goes where is to undermine the whole basis for the safeguarding system and to remove women's safety, privacy and dignity as well. And then, so trans activists say in response, ah, oh, but trans women have been using those spaces for years. But what they, that's a kind of Mott and Bailey move as they say, but what they mean in that context is passing trans women trans women who have taken hormones and had surgery and you who you know you wouldn't really be able to tell by looking of course their presence in changing rooms does nothing to undermine the social norm because they look like women but that's not what trans activists are now arguing for at all it's something completely different i don't know if you've been following the conversation in the us i'm american and so i've been seeing how the gender critical activism of the uk is shaping the conversation that's happening in the US right now, particularly in regards to the Kira Bell case and puberty blockers? I've been trying to follow. I mean, I'm obviously British, so I don't have full understanding of the context, but I've been trying. Well, she gets brought up in, in the Senate uh, sometimes when they're discussing puberty blockers. For example, the appointment of the new Assistant Secretary of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, her case was brought up in reference to this person's appointment because they had advocated for puberty blockers in the past. So in regards to this medicalization of children, what do you think is going on here and why people feel so strongly about giving these drugs to children? Partly I think what's going on is a kind of just so story, um, I'm afraid, as in it validates or somehow gives some coherency to the story about adults. And that story is you have this inner thing called a gender identity, which is innate, which is bursting out of you at a certain point and which cannot be suppressed or denied and should always be affirmed. That's the story about that's now being pressed about adults. And I really criticize that, that view very heavily in my book. 
but in order to validate that story, like this authentic me that has suddenly emerged that has always been there, but I didn't know it, but now I do sort of thing. Or maybe I did always know it, but nobody else did. Um, to validate that story, children are now being described as having those things too, those gender identities. And we can somehow tell by what they say. And if they say, I think I'm a boy, or even if they, they don't have to say it, they can just, in some extreme cases, you know, they can just exhibit sex non-conforming behavior. Their parents can then start to determine that they must be really a girl or a boy, you know, in a way that doesn't match their bodies. So that's a very, to me, a very disturbing aspect of this, really, that I think this whole construction, as Heather Brunskill Evans would say, the construction of the trans child is there significantly to prop up the fictions of the sort of um, backstories of adults. I, I, it's not that I don't think there are children who have body dysphoria, dysphoria about their sex, I would say. It's not that I don't recognize that I absolutely do children and adolescents but of course to say that they have an inner gender identity which is authentically them is is a is a particular interpretation of what they're experiencing and I think it's the wrong one now puberty blockers have been introduced really in a I think a completely irresponsible way in in the UK they've been presented in this horrible metaphor of pressing pause on puberty, like stopping you from developing post-pubescent sexual characteristics. Um, and of course, the body is not a CD player. And um, it turns out that the long-term effects of these on the body are poorly understood. And what, the, what signs we have, including on things like bone density, aren't good. Another thing that needs to be understood is that they stop the the regular development of the sex organs and if children go from puberty blockers straight onto cross-sex hormones which is happening in um, you know relatively many cases then they just won't have normal sexual function some of them for life and this is something that they you know that is happening to them before they potentially understand what sexual function is now it's turning out that a lot of children, relatively speaking, with gender identity disorders or gender dysphoria, or whatever you want to call it, are autistic. A lot of them are same sex attracted. I mean, being autistic means that you quite often you have a delay in your ability to you know, categorize things in the world flexibly. It makes sense then that you might have problems sort of mapping <laughs> uh, biology onto identity or whatever. And then there's also trauma in many of these children's backgrounds, which is not being properly looked at because of this narrative that really what's happening is that this authentic gender identity is making itself known through their behavior and through their speech. So I, I'm, it's incredibly worrying to me and scandalous in fact, that the medical profession, the psychological professions on the whole have mindlessly adopted the mantras. And I mean, there are exceptions, obviously there are honorable exceptions everywhere, but there's a whole lot of thoughtless behavior going on on the part of medics, endocrinologists uh, and psychologists. Absolutely. And the media has really failed to do its job in reporting on yes. this properly. Yes, um, I mean, again, with honorable exceptions, but, um, and the left in particular, you know, there's just this kind of taboo on doing anything other than giving a positive, what they would think of as this sort of Disney-fied positive gloss on any aspect of trans experience. You know, it's all about individuals and never about structure. The left has lost its capacity to look at structures and how they might be contributing to the production of the trans child. I mean, of course it makes sense that in a world which is increasingly sort of positive in inverted commas towards gender identity as a concept, then children will use whatever tools they find in the culture to interpret themselves. So of course we're getting more in inverted commas trans children. <laughs> this is social construction. 
ironically. This is the social construction of a group in the sense that there's a kind of feedback loop from the culture to how people are experiencing themselves. But yeah. none of that is properly being discussed. Right, I totally agree. Um, you had mentioned the rates of autism in children who are presenting symptoms of gender dysphoria. Recently, I was talking about this with someone how just about, I think, two decades ago, one of the same drugs that's used as a puberty blocker was purported to be a cure for autistic children. And oh. so I, I find the connection there to be something that it's interesting that it, it's popped up again. And I wonder if we ought to be using the word puberty blocker because it's not really, mm. I don't know if, it, if it's helpful. It kind of hides sort of the history of the, the drug there. But in any case, just um, so I'm, what I'm hearing is that you don't necessarily believe that there's an innate gender identity that one is born with. No, I absolutely don't believe that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I argue against it. I mean, I think it's a weird kind of essentialism Mm -hmm. that I just can't understand why um, sort of queer influenced academics are even aren't arguing against themselves because it's actually very much in conflict with a lot of what post-structuralism would say including what Judith Butler would say so it's it's like get rid of sex as a, as a sort of stable material fact and then insert this weird thing gender identity in its place to do all the work sex did I, I try and look at some of the um, scientific studies that are wheeled in to support this idea that gender identity is, you know, available from very young and somehow in the brain. And I just don't think that's what the studies show. Just from a philosophical perspective, I'm not a philosopher, but I, I just want to pick your brain on the background there that I thought the idea of innateness of identity was something that was argued centuries ago. Like, I think John Locke, John Locke had argued against it. Had he not? I mean, just in terms of like the background of philosophy, what's the idea there about sort of having an innate identity to begin well, with? Philosophy has been interested in the question of what they would call personal identity or what philosophers would call personal identity. Like what makes me the same person as I was 10 years ago? Or what is it? What is the continuum that, that sort of means that we've got one person here rather than three. And um, there's been various attempts to answer that question. Some people um, like Locke would locate the answer in memory. As I recall, <laughs> no pun intended, um, Locke would say the answer is like, what makes you you is that you can remember, you know, there's a continuous uh, memory with no significant gaps. And it, that, you know, raises questions about what happens when you get radical amnesia and things like that. But, you know, that question is, um, I think, although I'm sure it's related, it's not really the contemporary question. I mean, maybe it's sort of influenced in unconscious ways, but it, on the face of it, like saying you have a gender identity, it's being proposed as an aspect of you that's essential to you. I guess, absolutely. It's like, what's authentically you? It should be on your passport. It should be affirmed by psychologists. It's, you know, it's, you have a fundamental right to recognition of that identity. But I think identity is being used there in a sort of different way um, to the way the philosophers would use it when they're talking about personal identity. I mean, actually, to be honest, now you've asked me, I'm, I'm thinking, is that right? So <laughs> I think I have to have a think, more of a think about that. <laughs> Some others, like Jane Claire Jones, for example, they had argued about the dualism involved mm -hmm. in gender ideology that, you know, that there, you have a gendered brain or soul or something like this, and that it's separate from the body. Yeah. I, I wonder, uh, I'm sure this is not an original thought. I'm sure others have asked the same thing, but I wonder if that kind of splitting has something to do with the way that we interact with technology these days. Yes, I mean, yes, Jane talks about um, the idea of a gendered soul. So there's something really archetypal about the way that this discourse proceeds in terms of, you know, this thing inside you, which is really you and can be detached from your bodily constitution. That's familiar from Platonic tradition, the Christian tradition and so on. But um, in terms of relation to technology, I think psychologically, and I actually talk about this a bit as well, because given that I suggest that thinking that you know a male 
deciding that they're a woman is basically what's going on there or a female deciding that they're a male a man in both cases you're immersed in a fiction and then the taboo becomes it becomes really important not to mention that you're immersed in a fiction because that would basically break the fourth wall as it were and show that it was a fiction so when you're immersed in a fiction you don't want to draw attention to the fact and you don't want anyone else to draw attention to the fact that it's not real and that's true of all fictions like you know at the being at the theater and not wanting people's mobile phones to go off you know you just don't want to lose your immer imaginative immersion in what you're you're fantasizing so um that there's a big connection to technology because we're increasingly behind screens and it's just increasingly easy to construct a kind of or curate a persona for ourselves. This goes for all of us to show the world only what we want to show them and to get no kind of real time feedback from others. So, you know, you can see how many avatars are being used by kids who are into trans activism online. You can see the influence of Tumblr for instance, and like constant memes kind of capturing what the person really wishes was the case about them or representing what they really would like the world to see. Uh, so yeah, I think um, that's a big part of the story. And it's to be tied in again, um, academia and journalism really needs to tie in what's happening here to wider trends like the rise of the smartphone, the rise of self-harm in women and girls and uh you know other thing other sociological trends like that this is this is not a simplified story but when you think about it in terms of this gender identity bursting out of you innately then it becomes a very simple story and there's no need to try and connect it up sociologically with other cultural influences yeah the whole thing has kind of a the effect of silencing critical thought in general right because yeah. if you can't question this then you can't question the impact of media on shaping identity or yeah um exactly. other various exactly. things right yeah. everything's become about an individual's hero's journey you know it's really really simple disneyfied archetypal stuff you know the hero expressing themselves against the trend of their society to become who they really were always destined to be and that's basically the story <laughs> that's it <laughs> and, and that really does cut out an awful lot of critical thought as you say I remember a few decades ago, there was a lot of societal dialogue happening about anorexia and the impact mm -hmm. of, you know, super thin models on the identity of young girls who were seeing this as some kind of projection of what women should be. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen that same conversation happening in regards to gender ideology. But in addition to that, that narrative seems to be missing now you get the odd article about you know snapchat dysmorphia and things like that but the the societal conversation that was going on around anorexia like mm -hmm. changing laws to to promote healthy weight in models mm -hmm. was happening and now it seems as though one knock-on effect of the gender ideology seems to be that these types of questions overall like how is media shaping how we see the world and ourselves, you know? I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think um, it's my impression that really superficial solutions have been presented and, some, and in some quarters just accepted, like, for instance, like body positivity, which to me just looks like the fetishization of new body shapes. And it still looks like a kind of objectification as it is kind of practiced on Instagram uh, or wherever. So that's one reason I think there that the conversation has shifted slightly. It's basically been distracted. I do think that there are, you know, as you know, like Feminist Current is one of them, but there are organisations out there still really trying to draw attention to this. And, and in the UK, Transgender Trend has really tried to draw attention to the influence of um, social media in this area. So I really recommend anyone who doesn't know about them to go and look at their resources, which are huge and really interesting. But I also think that probably in this area, in the area of discussions about anorexia or objectification of women, like every other area, there's been a chilling because effectively modern feminism has changed the subject and we're no longer talking about women and girls anymore. We're talking about a wider category, wider in some ways, narrow in others because it excludes trans men now. So, and non-binary people. So um, once you change a subject, it's not a surprise that 
your conversations will lose their point and lose their interest and lose their their insight because you're no longer talking about females and the phenomenon is one that predominantly is directed towards females so I really do blame particularly academics but you know sort of feminist organizations who have changed the subject because it really does mean that all these fruitful looking conversations just got sidetracked. So Kathleen what is material feminism and why does it matter? (laughs) (laughs) Well I mean literally I mean the thing about this book is I've tried to write it for a pretty broad audience and I really don't want to get caught up for this book anyway (laughs) in any kind of detailed articulation of the feminism I prefer because I just want to say look feminism is about females that's what it is and then you know that's the that's the basic point and then after that we need a big healthy discussion about what that looks like so actually I haven't really said what I think (laughs) my feminism is or what I think the preferred route for feminism is but I'd like in future really to to properly look at that I mean one of the things I've done recently is is written a paper about whether gender abolition is a is a reasonable goal for radical feminism. And I think actually in many senses it isn't. And that's not because I think that gender is innate or anything like that. Although it might, you know, some bits of it might be for all I know, but I don't go into that. I just think that there are still reasons why sex um, associated social norms are beneficial to women in some cases. And that's gender, some of it. So. I mean, that's a provocative conclusion. And if anyone's interested, I, the, the talk I gave associated with this paper is online, so you can check out what I think. But that's the conversation, sort of conversation I like to get into. I think the second wave is really powerful and there's lots there to learn from, but there's also quite a lot to take issue from. And I think what we need is a kind of reinvigorated discussion about women in the, in the context we find ourselves now, which is totally transformed in terms of politics and technology and of course it depends on where you are as well economically in the world none of that's been done by the mainstream so this book's like a trying my attempt to kind of set out the basic rationale for why females matter (laughs) and why it's okay for a feminist movement to focus exclusively on them and then after that like you know let the games begin as it were Let, let the arguments begin what a weird time to be living in where (laughs) these things even need to be said. I know, I know. I mean, I would, I'm actually quite looking forward. In some sense, I'm not sure I'll ever get past this because things just won't move fast enough, but I would love it if I never had to talk about why biological sex matters Mm -hmm. (laughs) and why (laughs) gay people are same sex attracted again. You know, that was not the height of my philosophical ambition (laughs) when I started. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there does seem to be this kind of feeling that you just have to keep repeating the basics over and over. Yeah, Yeah, and there's something in it. There's a lesson there, I think, for us, right? um, The kind of myth of progress, I think it's kind of liberal idea that we'll just kind of keep progressing towards this glorious utopia. I just don't think that's right anymore. I think the whole picture of human nature that underlies that is also flawed, I think. The relationship between men and women is probably always going to be on some level antagonistic and so women are constantly going to have to be on their guard for like new um, dick moves. (laughs) Well most of the time we seem to be on the defensive so it's nice that you got this book out there to kind of get on the offensive. Well I hope so. I hope so but I mean it's just a book isn't it? I don't know people (laughs) will have to people will have to do um, their own bit in organizations, as policymakers, as politicians, it's gonna need much more than a book. What do you think it's gonna take? I don't know. I mean, I think the um, the discussion about children, I am really hoping in the UK, because we have a, we have a national health service, which really helps. We have um, a whole infrastructure set up as well to, to examine the, uh, the costs of, certain treatments I don't mean economic costs I mean in terms of well-being and to make sure that the the methodology is right so 
I'm hoping that that infrastructure will, it's, it looks like it is grinding into gear to look at things like puberty blockers, psychological treatment for children with gender dysphoria and so on. And that will hopefully, you know, then be taken up elsewhere in the world. I mean, I'm sure it's also going on in places like Sweden and Holland. So conversations are starting to happen in the medical, in the medical world and the psychological world, I think. So that gives me hope for um, what's gonna be the case with children in future. I really don't know about women's rights. I just um, despair sometimes. I just don't know whether anyone's ever going to take those seriously enough to be able to say, for instance, that women need their own rape crisis centres. I think they obviously do, but I just don't know if there's a political will to pay attention to that. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm kind of with you there. I do think that the attention being paid to the medical scandal happening now with children, hopefully will be a starting off point. But mm -hmm. in regards to what the outcome will be, I guess, I guess we'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. um, and how can people get your book? Uh, is it available on your website? Right. So in the UK, it will be, um, it's on sale actually now already, but it, the, a launch book, the launch date is Thursday and, and you can just buy it from anywhere you'd normally get a book, whether it's online or in a shop. And there's also an ebook version, like a Kindle version or a Kobo version. In the States and I think Canada too, it's a bit more complicated. You can get the ebook from May the 6th, but if you're after a hard copy and you don't want to just buy it directly from the UK and pay postage, then you'll have to wait, I'm afraid, till September the 21st which is when US suppliers start selling the hardback directly. But you can, if you're desperate, you, you can obviously, you can just order from a UK supplier. And I, I'm told that Blackwell's, which is a UK bookshop online, was doing free international shipping. I still can't really believe it, and I don't know what would be in it for them, but um, several people have told me this, so that might be something to check out. So basically, we can expect Amazon to start censoring your book around <laughs> September. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look forward to in the yeah. calendar. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And um, thanks for all the brilliant work you do. Thanks again for tuning in. Dr. Stock's book, once again, is called... Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. You can follow her on Twitter at DocStock with two Ks and find more information about her book on her website, KathleenStock.com. <laughs>